hello everyone and welcome to Boosting the Student Library Experience Through Online Tools, a Time to Higher Education webinar in partnership with Perlego. My name is Julia Gilmore, I'm the Branded Content Manager at Time to Higher Education and I'll be chairing today's discussion. Please note that a recording of today's webinar will be available on demand along with a summary article on the Time to Higher Education website in due course should you wish to revisit the webinar or share it on social media or with colleagues, which we do very much encourage. <laughs> So I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of experts from academia and industry. So allow me to introduce Matt East, Learning Product Manager at Palego, Hannah Groom, Content Delivery Librarian at the University of Essex, Sarah Ison, Online Distance Learning Librarian at the University of Sussex, Lisa McLaren, Head of Library Services at Solent University, Claire Snowden, Academic Librarian at Teesside University, and Joe Webb, Head of Library Learning and Teaching Support at Sheffield Hallam University. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And those of you in the audience will be able to put questions to the panel using the Q&A box provided. We'll try and answer as many of these as possible during the closing five to 10 minutes of the discussion. The traditional campus model is evolving with an increased emphasis on personalized and hybrid learning and institutions are searching for a way to meet these needs for both staff and students. A well-curated library of online learning materials can meet the changing needs of students whilst also supporting staff to make their libraries more effective. I'm now going to hand over to Matt, who will give us a brief introduction to Palego and how they support both universities and students. So over to you, Matt. Great, thank you very much, Julia, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, can I just check, can you see my screen? Yes. Great, so yeah, thanks again, everyone for attending. Um, so I'm Matt, I'm Learning Product Manager at Palego, and i um, delighted to be here today. Just going to give a quick overview on what is Palego. Um, and um, the, the best summary I can give really is that we're kind of known as the Spotify for textbooks. So um, Palego has been around for um, a few years now, and it was originally born out of um, a problem that our, our um, founders, Gautier and Matt, identified when they were trying to get access to the books that they needed for their for their master's courses and you know, were encountered with the, the huge and spiraling cost of textbooks. Um, so the, the concept of Palego was born really in how can we provide a system that provides unlimited access to textbooks um, across a variety of um, subject areas in a subscription model that, become, that makes content more accessible to a variety of learners. Um, so Palego originally started off selling directly to students and we've got you know, ten, uh, thousands of customers um, from across the world um, as sort of independent subscribers, but we also now sell directly to universities as well um, as, you know, the, the kind of all-in package for the universities to provide content to students in a, in a unified way. Um, and you might be thinking about, well, what, what problem does this solve? And I think if we go back to some of the core challenges that we, we often face across, um, you know, the content space within universities, um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's very well known that the cost of textbooks are, uh, you know, are increasingly high and increasingly and increasing quite regularly. Um, but often those books are only available on a kind of one to one model. This means that libraries are spending an increasing amount of, of money in making sure that the, the, the content is available. And that becomes increasingly more complex with different models and um, different agreements with different publishers. Um, and I think one of the challenges that, you know, that I've certainly seen from from being a student and working at university is that that can, in many cases, actually limit the, the sort of discoverability of content within, within a unified experience. You know, very much going to one platform for one book, you know, is, is, is quite um, challenging in the way that the sort of traditional library works. And I think the biggest problem for me that we're, we're, we're really trying to solve here is around concurrency. So many of you will be familiar that um, a lot of, a lot of ebook providers, um, limit the amount of users that can access a book based on a subscription at a time and that causes real problems for for students particularly in large cohorts where where the content is limited so what palego does is it provides students with um, an unlimited access model where there aren't any limits on on content where students can can access you know the books they need and over a million other books um so as i just mentioned we've got over a million titles in in the in in palego now um, you know, from core textbooks along to um, uh, non-fiction from a variety of subjects. I mean, we, we cover every kind of topic area from uh, quantum cosmology through to theology. So there's, there's, quite, there's quite a range there, really. And as you'd expect, we work with over 3,000 publishers, um, you know, from some of the largest names to some very specific 
niche and smaller publishers that um, you know, may, may not be as well known. I think the thing for me that's most important here is around is around the user experience. So, you know, we've spent a huge amount of time really focusing on how we can make Palego a really powerful learning product, a, a product that really enables students to, to take their um, take their learning from you know, all of the content they're reading and bring that all into one place in a in a seamless experience that that fundamentally is built on um, sound user experience. And I think the core thing there to mention is that accessibility is baked in from the start. So, you know, we are continuously releasing features that, that strive to um, improve the overall user experience and accessibility of the product. Um, and this, this, whole, this whole platform is designed to, to enable uh, much greater levels of, of um, breadth of usage of content than may have otherwise been available you know, elsewhere. Obviously, this fits in within your ecosystem, both within the learning manage, uh, the learning systems and the library systems. Um, and the key thing here is that this is an all in one. So students get access to all of the, you know, the, the textbook content all in one platform in a unified space, um, which you know, lowers barriers to entry, particularly around making use of the content for the learning experience. So as I mentioned, we started off selling directly to, um, to learners, um, but we now work with over 200 universities from, from across the world. Um, some universities adopt this for, for small cohorts of students, some adopt for specific parts of the university, for exa example, um, counselling and wellbeing services or um, to help students on placements or doctoral studies, um, all the way up to you know, the whole university using this um, as their kind of number one textbook platform. But more importantly, what do students say? So um, we survey our, our students every year to, to get their feedback on, on how this has helped them learn. And you can see from the stats in front of us that you know, a huge proportion of students um, really believe that, that Palego has significantly improved their university offering for, for content. And I think most importantly for me, it's that students believe that this has helped them learn and it's helped them succeed in their studies. So if you'd like to find out any more, please uh, go to our website, palego.com forward slash institutions um, and get in touch if you want to find out more. Thank you. Great, hey, thank you, Matt. That's um, really interesting, especially what you said about accessibility being baked in from the start. That kind of leads me on to my first question, which is I want to ask our panel, what kind of common accessibility challenges do students face um, that you found at your institutions? And how can you best increase the accessibility of these learning materials for a, diver a diverse range of learners? So, Hannah, hi. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, obviously, definitely having accessibility baked in from the start is always good. Um, I think the point about it being on one platform is a really interesting one. Um, in the sort of not even maybe an ideal world but in a world where we have everything on one platform that would definitely help either students with accessibility needs or actually any student because what we found is you know as matt spoke about that when they have to learn lots of different platforms they don't know all the functionality of each and every platform and why would they remember that when there's so many you know it's always going to be difficult and um, we hear so many times or oh, i prefer print because i can make notes with that and it's like you can make notes online but they haven't remembered the functionality and so I think, again, with the accessibility, if they're going to the same place each time they become familiar with it, particularly if, you know, if you're a visually impaired user and you're using keyboard shortcuts or things like that, that they get much more used to going to that platform. It reduces the sort of burden on them um, to have to get access to their textbooks. Um, so I think there's definitely something around having one place for everything um, that they can get used to accessing and not having to learn how to navigate um, lots of additional systems. I think it's probably very helpful. Definitely. And Joe, what are your thoughts on this? I think you need to unpick what you mean by accessibility, perhaps, um, because you have accessibility in terms of how easy it, how easy uh, something is to access for um, um, a user who has disabilities, might be visual impairment, might be dyslexia, might be any number of things and um, how you can make adjustments for that to work or on theirs. And then you've got that different layer of level of accessibility in terms of how your full range of users would access it. And remember, we're working with really diverse groups of students. You'll have um, those who are 
um, on campus, living close by, regular 18, 21 year olds, um, might not be working, might be working. You have, where I work, we have a huge number of commuter students. We have students who might be on apprenticeships in lots of different modes of study. And for those, and um, for all of those groups, what they mean by accessibility can be different things. Some people want to come to a physical library and work. They might want to work in technology, but they want to work on a campus space. That can be at all kinds of different times of day and night, weekend. Others want to be able to access where they are um, using a laptop, might be using an old style PC, but they also might want to be able to access things on their phones, um, working around shifts. So these are the things perhaps I, I, I think you look. And then there's that issue of accessibility and legibility and remembering and so on. I think quite a lot of research shows that um, it longer form reading, so reading a novel or something, still tends to work better in terms of recall and understanding and wayfinding if you use a print, print version. But short form, where I think when you're looking at a lot of textbook use or sort of reading this driven use, is um, I think digital's at least as good. The other thing in terms of the access points, I just wanted to say, is there are different ways uh, where I work. Our online reading list system is the gateway to content. So rather than using um, a specific, you know, going onto a platform, a student would use the online reading list and then access the material for that. And I know there are issues in terms of wider reading and that correlation between the more you read and the, the better you do. Don't know if it's no causation, but correlation. But I still think those starting points and how it's based how reading relates to the curriculum and that kind of independent study are quite significant issues. And they're oddly different ecosystems at different institutions and sometimes at subject level. Fantastic. And Claire, do you agree with what Joe's just said? Yeah, I was going to say um, about the accessibility that I was looking at it from, you know, how are students physically finding these resources? Um, so, as Joe's mentioned, you know, reading list systems, making sure that these resources are available where students actually are, which could be the, the, le the virtual learning environment um, via their, their modules, you know, be it Moodle, Blackboard. Um, but also, I know we were saying about one platform and students getting used to, to learning one platform but I do think students do pick up quite quickly um, how to use different platforms and there is a certain amount of um, common features amongst platforms um, but it's getting to the students first to maybe introduce to them showing how to use one service or one platform and then they build up their skills so it's very much about us doing promotion and training, both with students and staff, because I do find staff are the key, the, the road into students as well. Definitely. And Matt? Um, picking up on a, on a few points that have been raised here, I, 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 I kind of talk about accessibility as the big A and small A of accessibility. And I think we've discussed quite... Um, I think we've discussed a fair bit about the you know the, the larger kind of points on, on making sure that our content is... Um, is usable by a broad range of, 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 of students and learners. And I think that's that's really crucial. I actually wanted to dive a little bit deeper into, into, the, into the small A, really. Um, so I was leading some research with the QAA last year into digital reading practice, and we delved um, directly into what are the challenges, what are the, what are the specific problems that students have in both a, um, in kind of an access uh, perspective, but also in, in the readability perspective. And there were some really interesting findings that, that occurred, and this is kind of backed up by a lot of the research that JISC have also done around um, their digital insights. And one of the big challenges that students still face is actually managing multiple platforms, getting access through multiple systems. You know, we're still in a world, unfortunately, where in some cases, students need a different username and password to access one publication or one journal article or one ebook platform or another. And obviously, universities are doing a huge amount around that, but that is still the reality in some cases. So that's that's another point of accessibility that I think we need to think about. But from a student perspective on you know, 
also managing multiple platforms. I think there's a really interesting challenge here around the lack of interoperability. Um, so whilst we've got, you know, our content can go onto reading lists or it can become available in Blackboard or Moodle, the fundamental crux of the issue here is that if students are being expected to take notes in that thing and then take notes in that thing and then take notes in that thing and they can't export those things, they can't bring their thinking together in a way that we, we actively encourage in higher education. And so actually, when I talk about accessibility of learning, from a small A perspective, I think that's a big problem. And the final point I'll touch on, which I don't think we've mentioned here, is actually around staff. So libraries are fantastic at working with, with the academic and student community. But every single library that I've ever worked with has continued to have a challenge around actually working with academic staff as well in getting them discovering content, in getting them bookmarking content, in getting them actually finding the things that are relevant in the simplest way possible. And again, from, from the experience that I've, I've observed in working with, with partners across, you know, across the globe, but a really great way of simplifying that is having one <laughs> wherever possible, really. Um, so, yeah, touching on a few different points on, on, on accessibility there, but I think the big one for me is actually around cognitive load that we haven't touched on yet. Learning multiple systems um, means that actually we're taking away students' cognitive focus on the core goal, which is learning. Fantastic. And Hannah, what would you say to um, Matt's comments? Yeah, so there's a couple of things I wanted to pick up on. So yeah, I think about their cognitive load for the multiple platforms. I mean, I think if you know if we were talking, maybe they had like three or four, then yeah, maybe that would be fine. But we're not, and like you know, we have platforms. For every single different publisher we work for, um, the different aggregators we work for, so many different things. And so whilst yeah, they might be in a similar place, I think then like the functionality might look similar. Equally, you know, again, yeah, they're making notes, they're all in a separate place. So again, I could understand why a student would then go, well, I like print because I then put all my notes in the same place, i.e. on a piece of paper. Um, and so I could understand that. And so I think, um, and I know, obviously, I think looking at some of the points we might come on to this later, we do, you know, some students do have a preference print, um, but I think realistically, if we're to manage getting access well at least from our point of view we feel like if we're going to manage ensuring that everybody has equal access to a book that realistically that is through digital not through print um and therefore we need to do more about trying to understand so why is it what are the downsides to ebook and how can we overcome that and i think as matt was saying um about the qaa work um is then going okay so what what skills do we need to give students to be able to read well online so what is it? Is it, you know, OK, so reading in short bursts is better for reading online. So this is how you could do it and how we, you know, again, give our students the skills to do that. Um, and then the last bit that you were just saying about uh, academic stuff and choosing content. And I guess another aspect of that is obviously choosing content that is accessible for us to get and therefore accessible to students, i.e. so not something that was published in the 1980s. Um, so again, you know, I suppose having one platform is easier to that, but yeah, it's again trying to get academics on board to choose content that we know we can provide to all our students. And Lisa, what's your experience been? I think I was just thinking along the lines of something that's been a massive bugbear for me in my career and and is improving, I think, but, but still causes issues and that's around um, we still got a team of people who create accessible copies for students um, and that takes up so much time and effort um, and it, it's frustrating because for those students in particular they're you know they get the reading list they come to our team and say can't get hold of this can't get hold of that and we'll go to the various places and, and try and create an accessible copy and that can be going to the RNIB bookstore or it can be going to the publisher direct and it just it feels so frustrating in this day and age that we're, we're still doing this for students and that you know this this experience is not more seamless um, we had, Sarah works at Sussex and I, I used to work there too, and we had an accessibility conference, um, I think it was a year before lockdown, and we heard from a, a number of students with disabilities about, you know, their particular um, issues around access and content. Um, and although we have made some of the strides forward, it's just frustrating that those students, you know, still see those issues. Definitely. And Sarah, just, um, we just mentioned Sussex. What's your experience been at your institution? Um, so I support learners that are 100% fully online, scattered around the world in over 125 <laughs> countries. And so a really important factor for us is that students can download materials, which we haven't really talked about so much yet. Um, and so 
when students have the option through their reading list or through the resource discovery tool that we have um, to download something, that is the most important thing because we have students on degrees such as uh, sustainable development and energy policy, <laughs> and they're out in the field, they're juggling um, a full time job, they're studying part time on our masters, and they're trying to read their content. I don't know how they manage it, but they're trying to study and read three hours a week, and they sometimes they're out of Wi Fi, um, you know, for a long period of time. They want to download all their resources in advance, and that is a real struggle depending on the provider of the content, the limit on how many pages you can download in a 24 hour period and the challenges <laughs> of getting hold of that content, which is so frustrating when you have to have all this explanatory text around. We have single user licenses. This is what this means for you. And, you know, although we can afford um, to purchase a number of single user licenses, you still have to explain to the students what that means and how they can access it. And that is a real frustration. Um, and I think they manage from my experience of teaching them, I think they manage multiple platforms because they're all guided through a reading list system and they're connected to the chapter, they're connected <laughs> to the book they need um, in a fairly straightforward way. And the, the login is seamless. We're fortunate to have a good system set up. So they're not prompted for different logins and it's not that complicated. Uh, but my approach has been bite-sized tutorials and videos that they can dip into and know exactly what they're going to get out of that 15 minute session so they can watch it at the time that they need it and equipping them in the best way that we can uh, but there'll always be students that miss that they'll miss the emails they'll miss the session they'll miss the recording and they'll still come to you and they've studied seven modules and they'll ask you how to do something so I think no matter what you give them no matter how intuitive it is students will still come back and go I just don't know how to do this um, but it's good to just be looking from my perspective we're just looking at online everything has to be online for my students um, but the advantage of the physical library is that we we have the odd book that was from the 80s or the 90s, which may be for historical reasons. There's a useful chapter that is being shared with students and we can digitise that and make that available to our online students. So uh, which they can download and read offline, which is really important to us. So all the accessibility um, uh, considerations are so important. Um, and just this week, I was trying to support a student who wanted some read aloud options. So I'm trying to do a piece of work to um, give them a complete kind of packet of information of how they can access read aloud software uh, and then I was in a, a very popular e-textbook providers website and just looking at their options and the options were basically to have a heavily accented voice read this text aloud to you which was very frustrating <laughs> to kind of listen to I didn't really want to recommend it so um, you know I'm currently looking for excellent read aloud software but again that's challenging because on all the different platforms there's different things sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't so um that's an area of accessibility that's quite important to me at the moment that I'm looking into. Fantastic. Julia, can I, can I just come in? Oh, sorry, Hannah, your hands up. Go on. I was literally just going to say that um, for me, DRM is one of the biggest barriers for accessibility, to be honest with you, because it does, it means that our students, we have to do more for our students rather than just be able to download it and put it into whatever format they like. Um, so I'd say that's probably one of the biggest barriers to accessibility. There's, there's a, I can't disagree with that at all. Um, there is um, another area that we haven't actually accessed here, which is around the subject matter. So we've talked about accessibility of the platforms of the content, but actually the subject matter as well. And one of the things that's something that's really infused me working at Playgo that I hadn't really um, thought about before I joined actually, was how students um, who are studying a specific topic, who, who may come from, um, you know, maybe new to higher education, maybe studying in, in, a, in a country that's not their, their home country and that kind of thing. And actually, because we have such a huge collection and catalogue, we, we have got a huge diversity of voice within, within the space. And actually hearing stories from students who are saying, well, I was told to look at this piece of content as the core textbook, but actually, you know, finding, finding a publisher, finding a book that was published in my home country or from, from a completely different perspective on the subject, particularly in humanities and social sciences courses, has been really um, rewarding for me, to be quite honest. And you know that whole point around discoverability, and I, I think I used the phrase earlier, serendipitous discovery. You know, it is something I, I had I had underestimated. And whilst I take the point that um, you know we do very much teach from reading lists, and we do expect students to, <laughs> um, you know, to, to to work through the content which we provide them because of our scaffolding. I don't think we should underestimate the fact that you know we have inquisitive learners within our within our university spaces and actually sometimes the content that we're providing is fundamentally inaccessible because of the voice that exists within that content so providing alternatives to that is another way to lower barriers to entry for students that yeah we really shouldn't underestimate definitely 
And Claire, what would your comment be on that? Yeah, sorry, apologies, having a bit of a coughing fit here. <laughs> um, just to, to pick up on um, generally about accessibility, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I don't think it's been mentioned yet, is to recognise um, for accessibility, there can be like digital poverty and data poverty. Um, I think the, the GISC survey that was done showed that um, I think it was something like 50% of students can have problems with Wi-Fi, <laughs> with their broadband, or just have older devices that aren't compatible with um, our online um, products. Um, and then just picking up on something Matt was saying there about um, the students um, and what they're picking. I think that the, some of the purchase models now that we might have like um, patron driven or demand driven um, access can help to diversify our collections if students are finding material that meets, is of interest to them and meets their needs, giving you know a broader perspective, not just what academic staff are, are selecting for the libraries. Thank you. And Joe. I just wanted to pick up a couple of um, Matt's um, comments. I don't think we do enough uh, user experience analysis uh, of how our students interface with content um, at a local level, because as I said, that there, do, there are quite big differences. I wanted to, um, one of the problems I think we, we, we've in, we encountered over the last probably 30 years when we shifted towards digital content was smaller and more independent voices were harder to you you could find them on a web search but you but they stopped but because they came from smaller publishers um they 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 didn't fit into the big aggregator a lot of the aggregator models a lot of the digital content delivery models and you could and also our purchasing and procurement approaches where we buy a big deal or we do sort of go with particular publishers and one of the things I was quite conscious of having worked somewhere that did a bit of sustainable development um, when I qualified we used to get all these sort of odd things and it and buying odd things although it's easier with credit cards and so on just became more awkward didn't fit in with our modules uh, our, our business models and also didn't necessarily fit into our purchasing platforms or were geared up to uh, work with all of our authentication so there are lots of interesting things happening and it, it's it, it's good to see the scope to have more diverse voices represented in collections and current diverse voices. I think there's a lot of business engagement uh, or opportunity because of the decolonization and, and just diversification, having better voices. I think um, I just wanted to um, flag, we have to be quite careful about sort of library or supply centric focus sometimes, because for us, all the stages that you go through when you access a resource, are, um, we kind of understand that. And I, it's flagging up what other people have said. And a user, I, I just wanted to think, I remember I was doing some research and I, um, I don't know, organisational behaviour or something. And I was going, I, I think I, I read about 10 books or 10 things. And I, each time I went through so many different stages to read the same item. And, you know, I'm a librarian, it's quite easy to see those processes. But our students, they, they flounder sometimes because they've got the wrong browser. You know, something will work in Edge or work in Chrome or this or that. And they end up having to, um, people end up asking for online help. And the troubleshooting's really quite uh, fiddly because you don't necessarily know where they are and what they're using. And that's a huge barrier as... Uh, Claire was saying with the digital poverty um, or the d digital divide um, across. Anyway, I shall stop wittering now. Thank you. Um, so that kind of leads on to one of the next questions I want to ask um, about kind of in inspiring students to become more independent learners. 
So do you think familiarity with and access to a really wide range of academic texts and tools um, help students to become more independent learners? Joe? Yeah. Matt said the key word, it's a scaffolded approach. I think the, we don't know often very much about our students' prior educational experiences. And even in the UK, there's a huge difference between the, edu the experience that they've had at primary, secondary, sixth form, and so on. If you look at the collections, say, in a, an independent school, some independent schools will be buying JSTOR, so their humanities A-level students will be accessing sort of sometimes collections that will match what uh, you'd um, in subject areas that, that you'd have in a university. Equally, you'll have students who've come up through other routes or access courses or um, things who haven't had access to libraries. Remember, libraries, school libraries aren't mandatory. They haven't necessarily been to schools which have encouraged independent reading and research. They've taught to the curriculum. So the focus, I think, is about that scaffolded approach. And I think one of the things that's really striking when you work across a range of disciplines is the difference in expectations for reading and independent study as it develops through the curriculum. Um, I can remember, um, I've worked with, so if you use health students, they tend to have to read journal articles and sort of handle data and do research really from the outset. If you look at a computing student, they will find their way to reading research papers, but it's quite often rather later along the course and their study. And I think that issue and the nature of what reading means, if you think about reading and content for art and design students or fashion and the way you draw on it to find, but also to be inspired, varies. So you have lots of different ecologies. Um, but I think there is that issue that you need to scaffold access and then have a, a broad pool. Some learners are fine. You can just dump them in a swimming, you know, in, in a metaphorical library swimming pool and they can navigate their way around but others need to move towards that sense of reading and independent study because they've had such hugely variable experiences and when you think about international students reading is has a different emphasis and how you use your reading in what you write is uh, has it is can be different in different academic discourses Thank you. Hannah? Um, just a, a sort of quick one for me, I guess, uh, for me, key is about the range of materials um, and so that students can, I mean, probably with guidance, um, so that academic stuff, you know, help identify if you're struggling, this is a good place to start, but if you're a more intermediate learner, this is a better book for you or a better video for you or a bit of different sorts of media content that enable A, different types of learning and B, different levels because yeah you'll have a module where students are obviously all at a different completely different levels or this there might be something that you explain and one student completely gets it and the other student goes I've got no idea what you're talking about and so it's a chance for them to go if you struggled with today's lecture here is somewhere where you could go um to get a bit more of a basic understanding if you find it really interesting and want to know more here's some more things about it so I think a real range of materials is is a really key point here Definitely. And Matt, what would be your response to that? I mean, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I'm going to come at this this point from a from a slightly different lens. And I think you know, if we're trying to encourage students to become, um, if we're trying to enable students to become, you know, strong independent learners, there is obviously a level of there's there's an element of leveling the playing field. I think for for, for users, particularly around things like developing information skills, for example, and and all the things that libraries are you know are exceptionally good at. But actually, from from a from a, a, a software provider's perspective, I think that we have a really important role to play here in setting up students for success. And I'm thinking about things like you know we've, we've talked about various sort of layers of learning, and you know I'm thinking about things like like Bloom's taxonomy and you know the, the desire to kind of help students move up move up the ladder essentially or move up the pyramid. And you know our our systems and the systems that we 
as education lists allow or enable our students to use need to drive that ability need to actually help students you, you know develop those skills in in, in fundamental ways um, and I think that that is actually still a problem where if you look at many and I'm not talking about specific platform types at the moment but if you look at many systems that exist across universities and society they they, they focus on like the minimum sort of viable level on what can be done in this context we're talking about literally access to read something and that's kind of it you know for, for, for systems like Palego and others that others that exist as well it's really important that we have like a really grounded pedagogy essentially in our products that is driving the success of students in the right direction so they're so they're enabled to become more independent more effective independent learners um maybe without having to actually kind of think about it so much if that makes sense thank you claire i'll go to you next yeah <clears throat> Around students being independent learners, what I particularly like about online materials and ebooks is that students can support each other and um, around the collaborative learning because it's much easier to to share or notify someone about an online resource than it is a, a print resource. Um, you know, they can create their own reading lists and share them, create their own bookshelves. And I just like that way that students can then cooperate and, and, and work together. So, yes, they're independent, but they may be learning skills off each other as well. Joe, One of the key issues, I think, in terms of rewarding, supporting, promoting independent student independent learning is how reading and research is. Um, recognized within the assessment process so what i don't think we're very good at um the he sector library supplies is promoting this pedagogy of, of reading when you go to uh teaching and learning conferences the focus most often is on the teaching and assessment um and we know that learning is a kind of black box um but that independent learning of what students do in their in their time when they're reading and when they're writing we we don't talk about very much we might talk about um you know assessment or um, writing skills or other things but th this is the thing we think i i i would suggest that um reading and engaging with content is a way that learners start to individualize and construct their, their knowledge but I don't think that's articulated very much in teaching and learning policies or strategies um you you sometimes see places will have learning and sort of a, a little mention of it but it, it it it's it's a gap I think in um in um our in in a having a holistic understanding of sort of student the student learning experience Lisa, do you, do you mind if I just come back in on that point directly? Because, I mean, actually, what you've said there, again, from the, the research I was leading last year on the QAA, um, aligns really closely, actually, with a lot of what you've said there. Um, and I think something that, that really jumped out to me from, from my analysis was students often don't know what good looks like. Um, and good looks like looks very different from one academic to another and one discipline to another. And there is a problem straight away and I think actually if you we touched on this earlier around the kind of importance of reading and I guess the, the construct of reading in different disciplines um and through our research we found that you know it's in in areas like humanities for example the academics that responded to our survey were saying it's an absolutely um, indispensable skill it's it's absolute table stakes to to have good digital good reading skills good digital reading skills good ability to you know, to break down, to analyze, to synthesize, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yet this was not embedded. So actually, if it's if it's if it is absolutely crucial that students are building these skills, it's still not something that actually is embedded. And when it is embedded within a discipline, for example, it's often very inconsistent. And so the point of consistency is often the library, but the library is not embedded into the curriculum in this context as well, in many cases. So we've got we've got this real challenge where this is something that I think we would all agree is is, is a fundamental skill set for, for higher education, but it's still kind of seen as a bit of an afterthought. And that's why we've got this on level playing field in many cases. I think it's one of the reasons why. 
Thank you. Lisa? Um, so I had, I had a point and a bit of an anecdote as well. So jo Joe's talking around um, how much independent reading that some of the students will do will depend on the assessment. Um, and I, I once worked at a medical school where some of the students would say, well, do I really, really need to read about the kidneys? Is that going to be in the exam? Um, and then when it's you know it's your future doctor, you do you do kind of want them to have a good a good knowledge of these areas. Um, so I think some of those students it's, it's more important than others. But I think um, having worked in a university where um, we were making expensive textbooks available and paying quite a lot of money for those, what we did find is um, it, it all started with the, the, the academic staff. And I think it was Hannah maybe that said that the academics are the gatekeepers. And what we are finding is, like Matt said. If they would embed chapters into the VLE, if they'd use the reading list quite strongly, um, and not even just um, just making the chapters available, but also maybe providing a bit of context around why you might want to read that particular chapter, why it was important, and what leads on from that, um, it, it allows the students to kind of um, to see that. But the, the academics that did that kind of work and really embedded it in courses, um, we could see great usage of those books. Um, and the academics who said, oh, we absolutely need this textbook, it's very important, but then didn't ever mention it to the students, never talked about it again, the usage of those books was really, really poor. So I think it's it's really important for the librarians to be able to work with those academic staff to really get those books embedded and to to really kind of um, you know to, to do that and and that 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 again scaffolds and helps students um, move forward. I think. Can I just really quickly add something to that, Lucy? Yeah, we some of the work we did um, surveying our students about this was that how much they trusted their academics guidance and so they wanted to see that their academic had put that book on for a reason and so when they say this book is good for this it would be, they did listen to their academic stuff they did trust them so yeah thank you sarah uh yeah just um while we're talking about academics um library engagement with academics is so important because i've found myself often explaining like ebook licensing and stuff like that to academics who didn't realize the implication of them promoting a particular book and the availability of that whether or not we could even provide it um, and the frustrations that there is when an academic wants to recommend a really key text with four chapters and we're like yeah I can't get that it's only available as new textbook what does that mean oh this is what it means and then it's given me opportunity to explain um like licensing models what the implication is of that and perhaps to help academics think about when they're writing a chapter for a book where's that getting published and are we as their library even going to be able to put it in stock for their students to be able to access um and like that's just a really important thing that academics have been unaware of the whole ebook SOS situation where libraries have really struggled. And a lot of it came to the fore during lockdown when we just had to go online. Um, I say we, I was, you know, we're already online, but the on-campus um, institutions had to just kind of get as much online as possible and the massive challenges that there are with that. And although the idea of a one-stop shop is amazing in all aspects of life to make life easier, I feel that is unrealistic because there are big academic publishers that are pretty much never going to let their content go on any other platform. So unless someone can find a way around that in the future, that would be amazing. Um, but the other thing is the reality of life is that you have to learn different skills, different platforms. But if we can equip our students with the skills on how to search, how to do research, how to build a strategy, how to find what you need, they can apply that across different platforms. And I often say you can use these tips when you're Googling for your holiday, when you're doing this, when you're doing that, you know, other real world non-academic uh, scenarios and so I think a lot of the things that we do teach our students can really help beyond uh, you know beyond their studies um, in their sort of everyday life as well um, and that's just an important thing to remember in how we can um, support our students. Certainly. Obviously we're talking about kind of student support in this in this webinar but what I really want to talk about as well which we've also touched on is how can online learning materials support librarians by reducing the pressures such as waiting lists, stock issues and overdue books and all of the problems you face in your day to day life? Sarah? Sorry, me again. Uh, just a comment. It's kind of ironic that we still have waiting lists and people can't get a book <laughs> off an ebook because it's in use by another student, which is to me, one of the most insane things about ebooks, it's like the whole point is that a student hasn't taken a book home for a week. They're just looking at it and and the frustrations of trying to explain to a student 
sorry, you can't access that because you're the 12th person trying to read it. I mean, you have 11 licenses and it just seems like so frustrating when you cannot get an unlimited license. So, you know, we have turnaways. We have effectively a waiting list. We have to tell a student, sorry, come back later. Um, and that does seem a little bit crazy in this day and age. Um, but that's kind of a fact and something we have to communicate to students if you haven't got the budget to buy 50, 60, 100 single user licenses for an on-campus course, because you're not going to be buying that many textbooks for the library anymore. Uh, that is a huge, huge challenge that, um, again, I haven't seen how that's going to be addressed anytime soon because publishers are all swiveling towards that way rather than the unlimited license. Um, and then you do occasionally stumble across an ebook you need that's 35 quid for an unlimited license and you just can't quite believe you've seen it and it's amazing. Um, so yeah, massive challenge there. Thank you, Hannah. So yeah, I think um, this is almost not, a, not even about how actually it might reduce our pressures, but almost not adds to it. But the difference being when you were ordering in print, you very much did always work pretty much with aggregators. Um, you bought them from a certain supplier so that you could get all your books from that one place. And I mean, obviously, platforms like Playgo and others are now the sort of acting as aggregators for online content. I mean, obviously, other places, you know, the ProQuest, Gobies, EBSCO, whatever the world, the world's also did the same thing, but in terms of e textbooks. Um, and I guess the, but the difficulty here is the publishers that don't work with those and trying to think about how, you know, I can't manage accounts with every single publisher for e textbooks. I can't do it. I don't have the time. Um, it's a waste of my time anyway. Um, dealing with all the different platforms for usage um, and trying to understand trends and stuff and going, yeah, I can't have account meetings with all of them and try and understand, yeah, that this has been used well, this this platform isn't being used well. That's quite a lot of burden, again, on us to try and understand it a bit more. And so it's actually almost with print, it was sort of easy because you had it all in your control. It was all in your library uh, management system. You could see checkouts and everything like that, lovely. Um, so it is, it's almost a much more complex environment and to really understand how your digital uh what you're paying for digitally how whether it's value for money um and you know what what sort of usage there is i think that's is a difficulty definitely claire what's that been your experience yeah i think it's very much swings and roundabouts for the the positives for libraries um because yes it, it does free up time you know if we haven't got people shelving books looking for missing books students getting frustrated because they can't find books um, you know that that will free up our assistants to to do other things um, but then as you say we get tangled up dealing with the online queries that we get um, but what I do like about sort of our our ebook materials is I do like that automatic notification if there is um, you know if, if there's been a turn away because students if it was a print book yes some of them might reserve it but of, other ones might just think oh you know there isn't a hope in hell I'm going to get a hold of this book so we never really got a true picture of um of what the demands of usage were which we do get with with ebooks and the other thing to mention is um you know with a greater shift away from print yes we're always going to need print but you know we're, we're now able to free up more of our footprint in the library you know that so it's not so much just you know book stands and shelves of books that we're freeing up space for students for more IT space more study space um, because even if students are accessing materials online some of them don't want to be doing it from home or uh, you know from work they do want to come into the library and use our warm library physical building to, to access um, resources. So yeah, I, I think that's, it does have a positive on the physical library building as well. Mm -hmm. And Jo? I think we notice the Wild West sometimes with particular high demand titles, uh, digital ones, where a title will be withdrawn mid-year. I can see Alison Littles asked that in the Q&A. Um, we have that. So we'll have a, an item on a reading list uh, let's say typically criminology or health and it's withdrawn by the publisher so we and then we no longer have the ebook we will often have print versions um, and you have this odd thing that happens sometimes where you can get one edition as an ebook but not the most current edition so you find that you have lots and lots of 
fiddly um, use instances. Um, and there, there can be quite a serious issue of affordability in particular high demand areas, I think, where you'll see the price will increase or a title can be different prices from different suppliers as well. Um, and really quite significant price differences for the same thing with the same amount of access. Um, so there's lots of confusion, I think, and competition in um, business models. But I think the volatility of ebook content, because we because some we buy, some we some we're really renting, can be problematic. Where you've got areas that have got a high textbook um, uh, dependence on textbooks as the um, core to a module or a subject or to teaching you know where you'll have an adopted book that we that's the backbone to or to, to the curriculum so yeah a mess but we do get lots of data and we can analyze peaks of demands and we're not having multiple copy you know 40 copies of an accounting textbook but I exaggerate a little bit sitting on the shelves that you then have to move when the edition changes the following year. So it is efficient. So there are efficiencies um, and scope, but it's still a messy and complicated uh, project, which academic colleagues don't necessarily understand because it's not their business necessarily to understand that complexity. They want the end product. Definitely. And yeah, I'm really interested in that question that was asked about publishers um, pulling content out of the platform and how this can be problematic partway through an academic term. Matt, how to how to Playgo tackle that issue or is it something that you do face? I mean, it is something we do face, unfortunately, and it is something that um, that, you know, I think has been has has been communicated very effectively today on how much of a problem it is. Hannah and I actually were speaking about this exact problem about four months ago, I think, and how much of a, you know, a, a how much of a cataclysmic issue it can be for um, for academics who are teaching with specific content. I mean, the thing that we we do with Palego is, you know, provide the detail on what is actually being used, how much it's being used, and actually have a conversation with publishers. I mean, what what we've actually found is that in some cases, um, this can also almost be automated. You know, new editions come out, or you know, someone's made a decision somewhere in 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 the publisher, and the content withdrawal notices just put in so actually having a conversation about well hang on this is being used on you know by 400 students at that university it's a core reading but you know core reading on that and you're about to pull it before exams think of, you know, th I was going to say think of the children there but you know think of the students um um and actually to be honest that is something that we have found is is, is productive um now it's not always productive but actually you know conversation with our partners who are our publishers um is a starting point so they actually understand the veracity of the issue that they're about to start potentially but yeah there are there are a there are a myriad of reasons why content is pulled from platforms um and we are working to solve that problem but i think that i don't, I don't feel like anyone's cracked at any university yet either unfortunately lisa would you like to comment on that well yeah i think sussex are maybe having a go at that so um, we had a particular book at Sussex that was causing us endless problems. Um, it hadn't been pulled, but the price had increased maybe fourfold. Um, we had about 60 copies of it in the library, but it didn't satisfy demand. And what Sussex ended up doing was um, developing a new textbook um, for that with, with the Department of Psychology. And so Dr. Catherine Hall and her team and the library team um, led by Bethany Logan basically have, have, have kind of been working on that for the last year. And I think it's just recently been released in the last... Um, maybe the last month yeah. so, end of last month yeah I was going uh, to mention that as well yeah so, uh, I was gonna I was gonna try and shoehorn it in at some point Sarah but I mean <laughs> it's 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 one textbook but I I don't know how much money that's going to save the university and potentially the sector um yeah. and it's 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 a really good example of a university sort of fighting back against this and and, and developing their own solutions which I think yeah. has been excellent and it's not like it was just in-house Sussex staff. It was um, academics from around the UK that have all contributed to it. And I guess given their time, I guess, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but um, yeah, it went live um, end of February and it's going to be a core textbook on uh, first and second year undergraduate psychology courses. Um, so that and the like on campus, we're building a new library with no books in it. So I think Sussex is kind of doing a good job in kind of disrupting 
what is a library and it's the things we talked about in terms of learning and providing space for learning for collaboration for creativity there's no physical books in it but we're doing all we can to provide so much digitally it's like it's obviously the way forward um so there is a definite huge drop in investment in physical library stock and a huge investment in other digital and collaborative spaces and giving opportunities to students the most important thing from what you've said there, though, is the library continues to be the heart of the learning experience, the hub of campus. So, yeah, I've seen some really good examples of that. That I'm not going to say digital transformation, but that <laughs> transformation that has occurred within universities, particularly around libraries, so that the library becomes, you know, continues to be the hub of the, of, of learning and collaboration for students, and that that I think is, you know, brilliant to see. Fantastic. We've got about um, just under five minutes left. Um, for Q and A, so please, please do keep them coming. Um, I think we do have one question about um, quite a long question, so I'll, I'll paraphrase if that's all right. Um, so about um, levels of response. Um, so I'm thinking this is about in terms of feedback. How do you get feedback from students about their about the um, online learning, the online library access that they're receiving, um, and how do you kind of deal with this? Um, this feedback what's your way of implementing feedback Hannah I'm not sure well so I understood the question a bit differently okay. so yeah. for the person who asked the question please say if I've gone on, gone on a completely wrong tangent um, but I suppose it because it's just reminded me of some work that we're looking at, at the moment for our student analytics um, sort of program we have a yeah a learner analytics program at Essex and we use solution path I think is what we use um, and so we try and get data from all um, different sources to try and monitor student engagement and it's always said about it, it's very much a tool for um, encouraging people and identifying where there's problems and solving those problems before they become serious problems uh, rather than sort of punishing people but I guess um, the bit that I was possibly thinking that Lawrence might be talking about is how do you like so yeah in terms of because it's quite useful sometimes to maybe measure engagement against what everyone else in the class is doing um and you know having um so because yeah if, if no one is reading it then maybe that you don't want to punish one person when no one's reading it and obviously that's more of a problem maybe for the academic member of staff um and so i suppose it may be interesting to know, like to think about how you use those systems to maybe monitor that and think about what does it mean for someone to engage well with the library? And that's something that we're trying to think about at the moment. Um, in terms of the data that we can provide, how can we show good engagement with the library? Is it reading a book online? Is it um, coming to the library? Is it attending a one-to-one -one session? I mean, obviously the answer is probably all of those things, but how, and then how might we want to weight those things to show overall engagement? And I think that that's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that really answers Lawrence's question, but I just thought that that's a discussion that's ongoing uh, at Essex to try and think about how we might show that engagement and what it might mean. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was that was closer to what Lawrence was asking. Thank you, um, Matt. I'm, I'm going to assume then that I'm going to try. I'm going to try and respond in a similar kind of vein, and, and just <laughs> on points on data. I think um, building a profile on on a on a user or a student based on on one data point or one one vector of a data point can be quite um risky actually and quite quite concerning um and so the example that hannah gave where there's you know there's multiple multiple sources of data that kind of create a taxonomy essentially i think is is really important but when we're talking about reading um i think we've got to remember that everyone's different and what good reading looks like to one person looks completely different to another. And I've, I've always given this example, but you know, Hannah could read something in three minutes and comprehend everything. And it takes me three hours. Now that means that Hannah looks rubbish potentially on a, on a bit of, you know, reading, reading analytics data or anything like that. Um, and I look brilliant, but I still don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a bit of a problem there. Um, I think when it comes to this kind of data and something that universities still don't really do enough actually is qualitative like actually need to talk to some of our students a bit more um just so that we really understand like the lived experiences um we can get you can get so much you know from data particularly when you're talking at a macro level but actually really understanding the nuance of problems and nuance of challenges particularly at a course level particularly in an, in an environment where um the students may not be able to access physical systems that that are measured um becomes increasingly important. And I kind of want to see us do that more really as a sector. 
Thank you. And Joe, I'll go to you for a final point. Um, many years ago, uh, I worked somewhere that was involved in the library impact data project, you know, the one that was piloted by Huddersfield. And that was fascinating when you looked at aggregated longitudinal data because it showed a, cor a, a correlation across all subject areas between how much a student read and their degree outcomes. And there were differences. So uh, reading journal articles, so that based on Athens logons, tended to give more advantage than reading books, but don't do that. But the point about multiple data points, I actually work somewhere that has an evaluation unit, not the, the library, but the university that does exactly that kind of qualitative work looking on uh, with students. Um, <laughs> And um, it's really insightful. Sometimes hard to get enough participants, I think, in projects to, to get voices. But one of the things that's been coming out, for example, is how students want access to everything in all the ways that they can have. They, you know, they want face to face, they want remote, uh, they want virtual, they want um, a campus experience, but don't want to be on campus all the time. And it's the same cohort that will say the things which are quite difficult to triangulate we've got our usage data and all of those contact points I also think and, and sort of internal qualitative evaluation and user analysis of UX um, but the NSS and PTES and PRES can actually give sometimes use insights into what students have valued about their library experience and you do see when you read the comments someone will talk about the value you know the importance of the digital library how it's been a lifesaver for them um not everything but you do see a level of maturity and sophistication in understanding that uh, uh and, and and a value from that so so there are different places for it i guess the challenge there is those surveys are often asked as students are leaving <laughs> Yeah, and, and so you can't necessarily respond to, I mean, you'll have in-year ones, but I suppose you have to just see that, they'll, that they might have identified something that you can rectify or think or things to highlight for the future. But it's difficult because the, the needs that students have vary year by year, don't they? And time. Um, and, you know, it's a, if I knew then what I know now is always a problem when you're supporting learners definitely well unfortunately that does bring us to the end of our session um but i'd like to thank everyone for taking part today you've all been fantastic um and remind our audience that there'll be an on-demand recording of the discussion and a summary article available on the times higher education website in due course um and we hope hope you found today useful and hope to be able to engage with you at future the events so thank you so much and goodbye <laughs>